Hello and welcome everybody. Today we're talking to Kira and Adam Smolcombe, two of the finest people on earth. And we're talking about multi-site congregations. They run Vive in San Francisco, San Jose, and quite a number of other places around the world. So good to have you, Adam and Kira. Great to see you, Pastor hey, Phil. Pastor Phil, it's great to be here. Here we are, Zooming. <laughs> yes. It's a new part of the world. You must yeah. do a lot of Zooming with your multi-sites. I mean, we we are all Zoomed out. I tell you what, like, I'm actually ready to get back to seeing people in person. Yep. <laughs> well, we are doing a lot of that here in Australia uh, since we've been allowed to regather and... Uh, I'm telling you, people are loving it. Yeah. Uh, some people have said that the people are, aren't going to enjoy coming back. They're going to be nervous. We have not found that's the case. Only in the case of, you know, one or two. But most people are loving yeah. getting back together again. Yeah, totally. No, I, I'm convinced that people are ready to see each other. I mean, we're seeing it already. We're seeing it in each location. But uh, I'm looking forward to when we can do uh, conferences again and, you know, pack out stadiums. Oh that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Exactly. Now, you have uh, started quite a number of multi-sites around the world. Give us the current number. Uh, so we are currently at 10 locations um, around the globe, mainly in the U.S. and then two in Italy at the moment. What's made you start congregations in Italy? Uh, I'm going to blame you, Pastor Phil. Um, <laughs> you know, just just the way you start things everywhere you go. Uh, it was kind of just what would Pastor Phil do in, in the situation? And uh, essentially it was a series of events. We were there filming in Italy on a project and uh, just, you know, one relationship after another. And then, you know, before you know it, you've got a campus starting. Incredible. So how's it starting with people that you haven't really had a long time to get to know? Well, that's a good question. It is a great question. Do you want to talk about Davide? Oh, I mean, look, Davide was somebody that I met on Instagram. He's our campus pastor in Milan. And uh, when God spoke to us about literally starting a church in Italy, it just came out of, you know, being there and then not having any idea how to do it, but just kind of searching hashtags on Instagram and you have to become fast friends. You know, you have to go through some pretty quick development, trust uh, moments and really lean into the Holy Spirit. That's a whole new thought right there mm. because most people would think friendship takes time, but you're talking about fast friendships. I think I think friendship generally do, does take time to have history with people, but I think whether it's a long time of friendship, I think it's occurrences that make uh, fast friends. You know, when you're in the heat of something, uh, you, you see people who have been in soldiers in battle. Uh, they can be on the front for a couple of months, but are lifelong friends because they're facing an opposition together. I think that's what ministry does as well. I think if you're, you know, in, in the crucible of ministry on the front line, it's going to produce uh, years worth of relationship in a very quick, uh, you know, space of time. That is that is so true. How, Kira? How have you found relating to the pastor's wives and the women of your Maldi site, do you find that they congregate around their local leaders and then you all come together for your annual events? Uh, yes. I think all of our women are just, they're so dynamic and diverse um, in the way that they lead and all of them have different giftings, um, abilities. I think we have a really high number of of women um, serving in our house alongside their husbands um, in different spheres, ministry spheres. We even have one of our campus pastors oversees two campuses um, on her own, and she's a female leader. So, yeah, we have such a great expression of um, women who, um, yeah, That's gather awesome. together and advance. You know, I think part of the C3 culture is that women really can find uh a way forward with their gifting, their calling. And we have a large number of uh, locations that are led by women. We here in Sydney have had quite a few. And uh, right now we have one of our main locations is led uh, by a very competent uh, woman leader, Julie McConaughey. Mm. And uh, we have seen that in many cases. In fact, right from the beginning, we have felt that our women are able to rise up yeah. and preach and teach and uh, lead 
in all kinds of circumstances. And we see that right around the world. Sure. Kira, have you, have you come across that yourself? Yes, I have. And I think, you know, I was born into this house. I was born again at C3, Oxford Falls. Tell us so, about that. You know, seeing... Well, for me, coming into the church and being saved in the youth ministry and seeing the family in its fullness, um, I think that's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of watching you and Pastor Chris um, lead the church together. And for me, it's so normal to be able to put my hands to the ministry and build the church. And um, I think it's abnormal in other places of the world, but I think the way that we are planning churches with our church, um, we're creating spaces, especially in Italy, you know, for the girls in Italy to be able to serve alongside their husbands and build the church. It's actually quite a dynamic shift. Um, and it's really beautiful to see. Yeah, I think yeah. that um, I've been in your church and seen Adam really elevate you and promote you uh, both both on, publicly and privately to me. He has you know, spoken so highly of you. And I think that is a brilliant uh, combination there so that the, the husband isn't just the rock star and uh, the wife is knitting something up the back seat of the church <laughs> and really unengaged. And I've, I've literally been in a church where that was happening. Wow. And uh, there's probably places like that today where that's happening. I've been in a church where the wife is heckling her husband on the stage <laughs> <laughs> preaching. Would you hurry up and preach? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Disagreeing with, I think, oh, Lord. And then you do get the idea of some pretty celebrity-style preachers who it would be hard to to remember the wife's name. Sure. If I, I could say some names right now and you, you yep. wouldn't know the wife's name. And I think it leaves them in a vulnerable place yep. uh, for, for falling or for just open to other things that aren't healthy. Right. So I think keeping the married couple at the forefront of leadership in the church yeah. really helps. And are you doing that in your multi-sites? Oh, absolutely. Yes. As yeah. much as, I mean, Best we can. I think ultimately it's something that you pioneered uh, definitely with Pastor Chris. And I think when it goes to multi-site, you could, you've got to be exponential in your leadership. And so if you have a husband and a wife, you already have an exponential opportunity there for leadership uh, with different dynamics. I always tell people, you know, when you're finding a spouse, find someone with the same values, but different skills. Right. That way you actually become a super couple and, you know, you're not competing with each other, you're complementing each other. And, and so definitely we see uh, the success of many of the multi-site campuses based on the fact that we have couples really powering together. I think that's, that's such a good thing. I want to just uh, ask one more question on this. Mm -hmm. And this is the most poignant uh, question, I think. It is that now, let me say this, Adam, mm -hmm. I've known you for a while and I would say you do have a healthy ego. You're, you're, yeah. you're not short on, on a strong ego, leadership, let's do it. I'm, right. I'm ready to go. I'm called of God, right. et cetera. Now, that gives you a level of security, but sometimes people take that and just don't lead their wife into it because they feel I'm the guy. Right. So why do you think, and I want to help pastors and people who are listening in right now who may find this awkward and difficult because it isn't their history, it isn't their strength, and they are feeling pretty, all of us who are leaders have got a pretty healthy ego. You've sure. got to have it. Sure. But how do you... Th then promote someone else and others in your congregation without actually, uh, you know, yeah. wounding and and putting yourself down, yep. actually keeping the whole thing together so that everybody's feeling good about this uh, this team ego. Yeah, what a beautiful question. I think it's, it is kind of a, a sensitive question because truthfully, I think incredible confidence uh, is required to release other people, you right. know, to... To be so confident in who you are, I think insecurity means you have to kind of be the one, be the trademark image, be the the one on every photo and every brand and every series. And I think that's where we get a lot of celebrity pastors or professional Christians come from in our day and age. And it's got to be, you know, and they stack teams around them. I think that's that's fun for them. But I mean, what about all the other people that don't have an opportunity to rise under your leadership? I think the test of leadership is not how well known you are. But how well known are the people around you and that come through your ministry? That's so well and, said. You know, I think that's 
C3. I mean, we've got Absolutely. prolific ministers yeah. all across the globe so that have true. been birthed mm -hmm. out of one house. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's a testament right there. Yeah, I think uh, the fruit of leaders is not followers. Right. Wow. The fruit of leaders is leaders. Wow, that's great. I love that. So brilliant. Yeah, if you're looking for, so if you're just looking for followers, I think you might not be make, making disciples. And uh, I think that's so important. I want to know how you manage your 10 multi sites. See, I was, uh, you got two in Italy, eight in the USA, one in Hawaii. That'd be easy to manage. Yep. And, uh, yep. but how do you actually stay in touch with these multi sites all around the place? Because I do know some churches that have, multi-sites in far-flung places, and sometimes those locations or multi-sites have actually become independent autonomous churches because of the lack of management and connections. So yeah. tell us how you're doing it. Yeah, babe, you want to? I think, I think we've, we've had to be very intentional about the way that we connect with our multi-site campuses because they're not always visible. So we've got regular rhythms and cadences that we meet with our teams and we're, we're meeting with them weekly, yeah. you know, bi-weekly. So there's quite a bit of connection there. There's a lot of connection, but I think it's about the, the kind of grip that you have as a leader. Is it firm enough to keep it stable but loose enough where there's – you know, enough freedom for them to, you know, display their leadership and to, you know, do something prominent and try stuff rather than it's just be, you know, paint by numbers. Right. There's got to be this real finesse to the kind of leadership when you're leading, I guess, people in campuses and churches in different states and countries. It, it's, it's very cultural. It becomes very unique to that setting. So you need that firm leadership of this is the culture, this is what we're doing. But I think at the same time, can you just have a – you know, not strangle it. You know, can you have it loose enough where, okay, we see their personality come out as well? Exactly. And that, that is probably the most core challenge, I think, that, uh, that I know of in all the multi-site congregations that we oversee and beyond, that how do you put your imprint on every location to maintain a yeah. consistency uh, of experience so that if people go to that location, they feel like they're going to the the basic culture of that, what the leader is projecting. So uh, in, mm. in terms of the actual physically, uh, how you manage that, do you preach yep. through screens to every location or do you let them, the local guys preach or do you do a you mixture? Know. Yeah, I mean, we do a mixture. Uh, essentially, we were pre-pandemic, we were doing complete broadcast, you know, preaching from Palo Alto to every location. Uh, then, you know, when every church had to start meeting outdoors or in unique spaces and different settings, it literally forced us to change our model. Funny story, I was in Italy just before the pandemic, and I don't speak any Italian. Kira speaks way more Italian than than, oh, no. than I do, but, <laughs> but I didn't need to speak any Italian, I knew exactly where they were in the service because it was so formatted, Pastor Phil, that it was predictable. And I literally said to Kira, I'm bored of church. I'm bored of the predictability. We need to keep this so fresh and so vibrant that we couldn't, we don't even essentially, yeah, sure, have a run sheet, run sheet and structure, but can the Holy Spirit just hijack the meeting, you know, and, and can we just flow in the prophetic and let it be a little bit unpredictable? Then the pandemic hit. So, so really it's caused us to uh, change up everything. Now, now it's, a, it's a cadence, right? There is a bit of a cadence where it's a global uh, you know, broadcast, but we've, we're raising up dynamic preachers. Like it, it, it's always a shock. I don't know what it's like to you, but to see people start preaching and my goodness, they're fantastic. They're like amazing. And uh, for me, it's, it's one of the proudest things that I get to do as a leader globally is release people into their calling and their gifting and just go, yeah, go for it. It is fantastic. I remember seeing uh, Mitch Hammond, who was in our school as a teenager, like mm -hmm. in our educational uh, private school. Uh -huh. And he went through that. Then he graduated. Then he became the uh, chaplain over there for a little while. Then he came on staff. And the next thing, I'm walking past our Bible college one day and there's Mitch Hammond lecturing students in our Bible college. Wow. And I'm going like, he must be like 
19 or 20 years old. And, and that is the beauty of a permission giving culture uh, uh, where we will yeah. release people as soon as we can, not too prematurely. We yeah. want to make a success, every step a successful step, so that when they're released, they actually are competent and they are delivering content that people are really yes. being built up by. And I want to hear today's voices. And generally, those yes. voices begin with youth, with young people that are hearing yeah. something that uh, the church needs to hear. How old is yeah. the average age of your location pastors? Our, our location pastors are probably in their 20s and early 30s. Yeah, they're uh, having their first... You know, having babies. their kids, that yeah. kind of stuff. And essentially, uh, I think you've got you to recognize that shift as a leader. If you're leading, you know, multi-site churches and number of locations, there has to be a cognitive like a cognitive shift in you to not have to be the the total content creator and move into more of a coach role that that you know pulls content out of them and coaches them and i think that back to your earlier point if you're the man in every setting if you have to be the one on on the face of everything you'll never be able to make that shift to be able to draw the best out in others I think of, you know, what, what Paul said to Timothy, he said, come on, fan into flames. What's it within you? He was always stirring up and trying to pull out of, you know, the young disciples, what was in them. Yeah, exactly. So I, I want you to talk about that discipling uh, influence. I, I know with the, the, with the people that I am intentionally discipling, I would speak to them. Uh, well, I got a couple of guys. I would speak to them pretty well every day about something and I, right. I would pray with them every day. Uh, and it's the conversations yep. that happen after praying with them, uh, whether it's a short prayer or an hour's prayer or whatever. Generally, what comes out of that uh, is can be really feeding into where they currently are at. Um, and then there's yeah. the, the feedback on how they went, preaching, leading a meeting, okay. taking an offering, pastoring people, et cetera. Uh, how do you do that on an international or distant uh, remote yeah. situation? Yeah, great question. I think it's a number of things. I think it's the cadence, like you just said, like how, how regular are you doing it? Uh, you know, I think it's also the, the forums and the platforms that you use. There's so many different tools, right? You want a dashboard every Sunday report, but I'm not going to have time on a Sunday evening to have, you know, 10 different phone calls. So just I want a feed that just shows me highlights, updates, hits and misses. Uh, I learned that from you. And then uh, and then during the week, we're going to have an all in campus pastor meeting every week, a global staff meeting. But then there's the one on one calls and uh, that that cadence, but the different styles of communication are key. I think just knowing you've got access to, right, that's that's huge, that if there is something pressing that comes outside of that cadence of meeting, there's open, you know, open door to, to talk and chat and ask questions. But I think it's the, it's like the rhythm of date night, right? For, for Kira and I, we want to set a rhythm of date night, but that's not the only night we talk. Uh, <laughs> we've just made sure we've allocated a specific night to make sure that that doesn't fall over. But we're in communication all the time. And I think it's the blend of both. Right. Do you, uh, Kira, do you ever give feedback to any of the women about their preaching or about how they went? Because the reason I ask is because I find it uh, pretty challenging to talk to a lady and give her feedback about anything. I'd rather talk to her husband and try and help or else if I really do need to talk to her, I will ask to meet with them together. Um, unless it's just something really surface. It's not a it's not a personality issue. It's not a behavior issue. It's just something, hey, um, maybe we could, you know, fix that particular little area up. But uh, but tell me, tell me about how you'd bring because there are, I think this is an awkward awkward situation sometimes in the whole discipling process that I'd like to know how to actually uh, negotiate better. I'll probably just say this because honestly, like uh, that's probably why a lot of churches historically just dealt with men in ministry. Yes. Uh, because there was a lot of awkwardness around this area. Yes. <laughs> I will say, Pastor Phil, though, we've created a pretty awesome environment where um, my girls actually invite feedback. Beautiful. Like, they've they've 
to be hungry for it. So I think when you're the asker of the feedback, you're ready right. to receive what it is that's going to come at you. And I don't think I have any problems with confrontation at all. I'm definitely <laughs> going to be the confronter. Adam's shaking his head. Yeah, he's going, he's going like, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Every day. You, you've you've, like, you've you know, told me she is called, the velvet hammer. Yes. That's why, yes. because it's, um, you know, it's truth in love. And I think um, when you deliver truth, it resonates with someone. And, and these girls, we have enough relationship to know that they know I love them and they know that I'm telling them because it's going to enhance them, it's going to enhance the ministry on their life, and it's not to harm them. So, you know, it's hard to swallow sometimes, but, you know, yeah. it's necessary totally. to grow. Oh, but Pastor Bill, I will say this. Yep. I will say traditionally women confront, men challenge. Okay. So women have got no problem with confronting somebody on right. something. Men are traditionally good at confronting. We, we pose a challenge to them to rise right. or to change or to do this. Uh, and so I think you need both settings. Oh, you do. The only way we're ever going to change if, is if we know we need to. Yep. If we won't admit that we need to change, we're going to stay stuck. Right. And too many people and churches are stuck because they are not, as you said, Kira, hungry for feedback. And pretty well everywhere I go to preach or to speak, I, the pastors afterwards say, can you, can you talk to me about anything you saw that needed? And you know, very often, because they got that attitude, I got nothing much to say at all. Right. Maybe just one or two things, but it's not. But the people who never ask that, because they think, I'm good, I'm okay. There's so many things I'd like to say, but oh, I just, you know, I think, man, I'll give you, I'll give you something that I think you're, you're at a level to receive, because a rebuke is a gift. And uh, it's, yeah. it's a kiss from God. And you, if we can understand that that's what it is, it's going to help us change and therefore grow into what we're meant to be. Look, we're going to call it quits right now and we're going to come back into our next session. God bless you. Thanks for talking with us. 